Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Faye Yarbrough. I'm a professor in the Department of History and I'm also um, an Associate Dean in the School of Humanities. And I host these Humanities Now lectures. Um, we will have two more of these lectures, this, uh, the, this, these conversations this semester. On October 5th, we will have Eric Huntington who will talk about color across science and the humanities how people perceive color, the meanings we attach to it. And then on November 18th, we have a um, conversation with Jamin Kim. Um, these two, Eric Huntington and Jamin Kim are new professors in our Department of Transnational Asia. And he will be talking about, oh, he just sent me a message about it. Um, two different groups of immigrant um, experiences, uh, think in the 20th century, but he will be speaking November 18th. So the next two are October 5th, November and November 18th. And we're happy for um, everyone to join us. The goal of these conversations um, is many fold. So one um, is to introduce uh, folks to some of the stellar teachers that we have in the School of Humanities. Um, but two is to open up space for uh, us to have conversations about topics that are related to the humanities and connect to um, the world around us to, to our present moment. So part of the argument in having these conversations is that uh, you need the humanities to understand what's happening in the world around you. So hopefully um, this gives you a, a taste of that. So today we're very fortunate that we have uh, Laura Correa Ochoa, who is a Rice Academy postdoctoral fellow here in the history department. And she comes to us from Harvard University, and she will be talking to us today on the topic, Redefining Peace, Black and Indigenous Activism and Racial Justice in Colombia. All right, take it away, Laura. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. And I'm really happy to uh, be part of these conversations and talking about contemporary uh, questions. So um, I see myself as a historian of Latin America and the Caribbean with a focus on Colombia and the questions that drive my teaching and my research revolve around race, ethnicity, inequality, violence, and political mobilization across the Americas. And I am currently working on a book project that looks at the entangled histories of Black and Indigenous mobilization in Colombia from the 1930s to the contemporary period. And these are histories that are generally studied in isolation. So today I'm going to talk about the contemporary uh, side of, uh, of my research, which I historicize in the book, or I will historicize in the book in the next few years, I guess, to be more precise. When Colombian politics uh, receive any coverage in North America by mainstream outlets, what typically receives the most attention, what typically receives the most attention is the armed conflict between the Colombian state and various armed groups, including guerrilla rebels, paramilitaries, and drug cartels, which has been going on by at least uh, five decades. And we can see the focus on, on, on violence and on the war in a few headlines I picked from the New York Times from the past two decades. Many of you have also probably watched or heard about Netflix series such as Narcos and shows such as this ones, which are part of a longer history of representations about Colombia, tend to reinforce in the collective imagination ideas of Colombia as pathologically violent and in a constant state of chaos. But what these shows tend to downplay, in, a, in, in addition to sensationalizing the violence, is to downplay the historical as well as uh, the class and racial dynamics of political conflict in the country. Both media coverage and shows such as Narcos at times also suggest that the war on drugs in the country, which has been largely fund funded by the United States, is the country's major problem or the main prism for understanding Colombians most recent turbulent history. But what is typically sidelined entirely or entirely erased from these conversations and debates are the racist and very racialized dynamics of violence of the armed conflict in Colombia. And furthermore, the political struggles of black and indigenous peoples who have been disproportionately affected by decades of war. And this process of erasure goes beyond media representations. As I will explain in a little bit, it has been a defining feature of peace building policies in the country in the past decade. 
Today, I am going to talk about the ways in which Black and Indigenous activists in Colombia are redefining the meaning of peace and peace building by centering the max for social and racial justice. I suggest that through their activism, they're challenging official narratives and policies of peace building, which often frame peace almost exclusively as a cessation of conflict and frequently ignore the ways in which race and racism structure the dynamics of the war and the way in which Black and Indigenous people experience political violence in the country. So let me give you a little breakdown of uh, ethno-racial uh, population, uh, in the ethno-racial population breakdown in Colombia. So the indigenous population is about 4.4% of the national population, which is approximately 2.2 million, whereas the Afro-Colombian population is a little bit trickier to define. Uh, according to state numbers, it is approximately 9.3%, which is only 4.4%. Uh, 6 million, but this figure is very much contested both, both by, uh, black, by uh, black activists in Colombia and by international organizations who tend to estimate it to be around 26% of the national population, which makes Colombia, by some estimates, the third largest population of African descent in the Americas after Brazil and the United States. And I am happy to talk about why the measuring the Afro-Colombian population in Colombia and in, often in Latin America is, a little, is quite tricky. I look at the Ethnic Commission for Peace, which was founded in 2016 by prominent Black and Indigenous organizations around the peace negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC guerrillas or the uh, Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, gives us a powerful window into how Black and Indigenous people have been sidelined from peace building debates and how they are successfully organizing against these forms of exclusion. After four years of intense negotiations on March 23rd, 2016, the Colombian government for, for, uh, under former president Juan Manuel Santos and the FARC guerrilla signed a peace deal that sought to put an end to the longest civil war in the Americas, at least half a century. While the origins of the Colombian conflict are extremely complex and contentious, we can largely trace its origins to the ideological and political conflicts of the Cold War in the mid-century and particularly going from the 1960s forward. The FARC, for example, was one of several leftist guerrillas uh, that were formed in Colombia in the 1960s and the 1970s, and some of them are still uh, operative. Yeah, despite the impact of the war on ethnic communities and having ethnic and territorial rights explicitly aligned in the constitution, for most of the negotiations which took place in Havana, Cuba, Afro-Colombians and indigenous people were not seen as a political actors who should participate in the drafting of the peace deal. In fact, most of the negotiators were white and overwhelmingly men, and those on the government side from, primarily from the upper classes. And let me pause here and explain what I mean by constitutional rights and by disproportional impact. In 1991, Colombians drafted a new constitution which replaced one written a century prior. The mobilization of Black and Indigenous activists resulted in the new constitution declaring Colombia a multi-ethnic and a pluricultural nation and recognized for the first time in the nation's history Black people Black and Indigenous people, as well as Roma people, as distinct ethnic groups with particular rights. The Colombian Constitution is regarded as one of the most progressive constitutions in Latin America in terms of multicultural rights, because it allocated extensive collective land and cultural rights to certain Black and Indigenous populations, but per particularly to Indigenous groups. And this is evident in the breakdown of collective land that were allocated uh, to all black and indigenous populations. Let me give you a little bit of, um, of the breakdown, which I think shows both how massive of an achievement the 1991 constitution was, but also some of the, this, the particularities between blackness and indigeneity in Colombia, which I'm also happy uh, to talk about, particularly when it comes um, to land rights. So from the map, you can see the in green are the indigenous word guardos, which are comparable, but different from uh, Native American reservations as an example. And with the bluish greenish is uh, the territories of black communities. And in Colombia, race and geography are very intertwined. 
So the country's peripheries are primarily occupied, have the highest concentrations of black and indigenous people, and particularly on the Pacific coast of Colombia, which is where uh, some areas the population is 90 to 95% Afro-Colombian. And as you can see, that's where the majority of Afro-Colombian territories um, um, are held. So in the indigenous words, in total, Black and Indigenous collective lands are approximately 34% of the national population, of the national continental area. And again, this highlights how significant the efforts around the constitution were in acquiring collective lands. Both Black and Indigenous people who have claims to these lands emphasize the centrality of ancestrality and uh, collective territorial claims. So these lands do not, are not based on, on traditional individual property regimes, but rather on collective and ancestral uh, regimes. And the indigenous population in particular holds approximately 284 uh, of the national continental area uh, and Afro-Colombians approximately 5.5 million hectares. And again, if we compare it to the different population sizes, it is remarkable how significant the indigenous um, lands are. However, despite how remarkable these achievements are, the conflict escalated in the 1990s, in particular around the escalation of the war on drugs and in the 2000s around uh, the war on terrorism, which again was primarily funded um, by the United States government and military. And under these conditions, the ethnic and territorial rights of Black and Indigenous communities came increasingly under threat and millions of Black and Indigenous people became the victims of massive human rights violations, such as massacres, targeted killings, land dispossession, and displacement at the hands of both armed actors and the state. And these processes of uh, land dispossession tend to be attached to efforts to produce both coca and cocaine, as well as uh, development of projects from the state, agribusinesses, and illegal and legal forms of mining, particularly on the uh, both in the Pacific and in the Southern Amazonia part of the country. And I think just to convey an example of how significant the impact of, of the war has been on Black and Indigenous communities, Colombia has one of the largest numbers of internally displaced populations, which is about 6 million people. And this often is, has been higher than even the conflict in Syria, just to put it in perspective. And of these 20% of the displaced are black and indigenous populations. And the majority of them being women who then are forced to move to urban centers where they experience incredibly high levels of poverty and economic, social and racial discrimination. And these um, very concerning numbers is in part why the exclusion of indigenous people from the peace talks was so problematic and what also led to the formation of the Ethnic Commission for Peace. And this commission successfully mobilized to be included in the talks and its relentless activism resulted in the inclusion of a chapter on ethnic minorities in the final peace agreement. And part of the activism of, uh, of, these, uh, of these communities revolve around lobbying the international community, including lobbying members of the US Black Caucus, as well as representatives from the Obama or, uh, administration. And as you can see from this photo, this process continued even after um, the 2016 peace deal. And the argument that Black and Indigenous communities made were that since the US was contributing financially, had a political stake, in what was happening in Colombia and in the signing of the peace, they had a responsibility to ensure that the peace accord will respond to the particularities of blackness and indigeneity in relation to the conflict. And this chapter uh, calls for collective reparations as well as the implementation of constitutional rights of many black and indigenous people for territorial autonomy and ethnic rights. In other words, what the ethnic chapter calls for is for the fulfillment and implementation of the 1991 constitution. And let me read you uh, the opening uh, paragraph of the ethnic chapter, which highlights the main arguments of Black and Indigenous activists during the peace negotiations, which argued that the situation of ethnic groups in Colombia was not simply about the most recent war. 
but it was a continuation of dynamics set in motion by colonialism and by slavery. And furthermore, that the peace deal had to account for the collective and disproportional experiences of war and violence. In other words, there had to be a collective accounting and a collective process of reparations. And I quote, that the national government and the FARC EP recognize that ethnic peoples have contributed to building lasting and sustainable peace, progress, economic and social development of the country and have suffered historic conditions of injustice as product of colonialism, slavery, marginalization, and dispossession from their land, territory, and resources. They have additionally been affected by the internal armed conflict and should be guaranteed full access to their human and collective rights in the context of their own aspirations, interests, and worldviews. Considering that ethnic people should have control of the events that affect them and their lands, territories, and resources, while maintaining their institutions, cultures, and traditions, it is fundamental to incorporate the ethnic and cultural perspective for the interpretation and implementation of the final accord for the termination of the conflict and the constitution of a stable and lasting peace deal. Again, and it sounds a bit repetitive, but this was clearly a very remarkable achievement on the part of Black and Indigenous organizations. But since the signing of the peace deal in the, in the past five years, there has the conflict has actually not decreased, but in some areas has profoundly intensified. And these are some of the realities that often just don't make it through um, the North American media, despite um, the role that the United States plays both as a political and financial actor in Colombia. In the last five years, the agreement between the government and the FARC has failed to deliver peace and the current administration of uh, right-wing president Ivan Dukas has taken aggressive steps to dismantle the peace accords, including his ethnic provisions. According to uh, a Colombian think tank in the past, since his passing in 2016, at least 1,166 activists have been murdered, along with 267 activists and demobilized FARC members who decided that it was time to put down the arms and try to reimagine and rebuild Colombia in a different way. Indigenous leaders account for approximately one third of the total victims, even though the indigenous population represents less than 5% of the total population. And this dark, um, figure reveals the incredibly racist and racialized dynamics of the war once again. And from January to April of this year, there were also a total of 28 massacres, the mass majority happening in the Pacific region, which as I pointed out was uh, one of the areas primarily populated by black and by indigenous people and in uh, Afro-Colombian collective territory. Even so, the ethnic commission and black and indigenous organizations have been at the forefront of ensuring that the peace deal and its ethnic chapter is implemented. They have organized marches, participated in national strikes, including a very recent one, which might have made it to uh, the US news because the uh, Colombian government was incredibly repressive. And they have also organized dozens of events with the international community, including getting Noam Chomsky, Angela Davis, to sort of um, participate in kind of transnational conversations um, regarding the situation of ethnic people in the country. I am going to conclude uh, by briefly talking about the presidential campaign of Francia Marquez. She's an Afro-Colombian human rights and environmental leader in 2008. She received the prestigious Goldman Prize for her activism against legal and illegal mining uh, in Afro-Colombian territories in the Pacific coast. And she has been uh, part of the processes of the ethnic commission and other uh, important Afro-Colombian and indigenous organizations in the country. Marcus is running as part of a leftist coalition in the country. And if she were to win, she will be the first woman and the first black woman to be elected to the presidency, both in Colombia and in Latin America. Uh, Colombia had an Afro-descendant uh, male president in the 19th century, just to point it out. And the, the central agenda that she's advocating for is promoting the redistribution of wealth. Colombia has one of the most, uh, is one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, particularly with regards to land tenureship. Uh, addressing the economic, territorial, and social problems of Black and Indigenous people, including uh, fighting against racial discrimination and racism. 
uh, providing reparations for victims of the war. And again, we see the interplay between um, Black and Indigenous organization and peacemaking, transforming the country's extractivist model, which has been uh, incredibly neoliberal since the 1980s, and it tends to have a disproportional impact on Black and Indigenous territories, as I mentioned, and as well as abolishing the country's carceral model, which disproportionately targets the poor and in many parts of the country, Black and Indigenous men and women. And again, uh, her work is very much connected to contemporary discussions against, uh, around um, racial capitalism and carceral violence. And in a recent um, conversation that she had with Angela Davis, this was one of the topics uh, that they were sort of uh, discussing and the possibilities for building South to North solidar solidarity between progressive movements. Francia Marquez, like many other Black and Indigenous activists in Colombia, for them, peace does not simply mean that the armed actors, actors put down their weapons. Rather, it implies transforming historical power structures and the economic, racial, and gender systems of exclusion and exploitation that have defined the country's history. Marquez, who foregrounds gender and Black feminism in her work, explained recently in an interview that the leftist political project she was advancing stemmed from a need to reimagine politics, and I quote, from below and from the country's periphery, so that the majority of the population came to believe that they actually had power. In her view, power should not be the monopoly of the privileged elite and privileged white men. Rather, it was found in the streets, in the people, in popular areas, in indigenous people, Afro-descendant, peasants, and women. And I will leave uh, here my talk and um, I, will look, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so now we are open for questions from the audience. Um, you may raise your hand and ask a question. You may um, use the chat feature if you feel more comfortable doing that to ask a question. Oh, Dr. Lopez Alonso is very fast to ask a question. <laughs> now, I have to admit, normally as the host, I I cheat and I take the first question. <laughs> I take the privilege of the first question, but because Dr. Lopez Alonso is so fast, I will I will save mine and um, let you go ahead. Dr. Lopez Alonso. Thank you very much, Dr. Yarbrough. Dr. Correa, I very much um, enjoyed your presentation and I have several questions um, on your like for clarification that are very, you know, that I find very intriguing and, and that can enlighten us even more about the relevance of the Colombian case. And so um, first thing, going to, to the earlier part of your, of your presentation, when you mentioned the indigenous population, uh, if, if you could elaborate more on the diversity of the indigenous population, because, you know, they, they are important actors and yet um, their percentage seems to be rather small. How in the, in the population census or, and how the constitution defines an, an indigenous person as such? And I mentioned, I mean, many of the, my, my questions are going to be as a Mexican and like the, how the, the Mexican case mirrors the Colombian case which illuminates on how the, the uh, Latin America is a diverse region and you know even their Afro Afro um, Afro descendant population and the indigenous can be different so how do they define now following up on the indigenous how diverse are the indigenous you know you mentioned geography and yes Colombia is one of the mega biodiverse countries and multiculturalism and pluri-ethnic societies tend to develop emerge more in countries with a geography such as such as the Colombian one. And so how diverse is indigenous population? And in terms of politics, how well do they get, how, how do they interact with each other? Mm -hmm. I'm asking this because I know one of the reasons why it's been the, the conversations among indigenous in, in, in Mexico have been stalled is because they cannot reach an agreement. And because they are so diverse, it's really hard for them to come to an agreement as, as a collective of indigenous. How does this look in the case of Colombia? The other thing is uh, on the issue of, um, on the topic of Afro-descendants, does Colombia make a difference between Afro-Colombians and Afro-descendants? And this is a village idiot question because I know that in Mexico, it is something, it, the distinction is made 
and you know I, I know this because it's um, for the first time in um, in the population census the question about Afro descendant Afro Afro Mexicans and Afro descendants has been formulated. So um, just because this is I mean it's a different history than the, than the history that of Mexico. How how does it play in in, in Colombia, which is fascinating because you know uh, slavery was abolished later in in Afro in Colombia than it was in Mexico, and um, so, and before, were there any differences in, you know, I find fascinating this, the 1991 constitution, Mexico had this, this acknowledgement of being a multi-ethnic, multi-diverse, uh, plural, ethnic, plural, plural linguistic um, populate, um, country in the 1980s. So is, is Colombia recognized as, as a plural, um, plurilingual um, society? I mean, I, I don't know, I would like to know. And this also um, brings me to the issue of like, where were the rights of the, the Afro Afro Colombians and indigenous, and the constitution? Does this permeate into education? Are there changes? Um, because this is one way of fighting, uh, you know, marginalization and inequality. Is there a provision for um, indigenous or, or multilingual education among Colombians? I mean, this is something that I was um, that I was curious about. And then also, could you elaborate a little bit more on how the land tenure, I mean, this is another thing where, you know, it mirrors, I mean, there's there's commonalities with Mexican history um, because of FARC and all the, on all this conflict, it's an agrarian, it starts as an agrarian co uh, conflict. So I'd be curious to know, I mean, what kind of rights and like what they constitute, I mean, what were the rights to peasants, both Afro, Afro descendants and indigenous in terms of their, what, what were they fighting for? I mean, this is as you know, someone who experienced the, the you know, who, who teaches on the, the agrarian, the agrarian reform and agrarian origins of underdevelopment in Mexico. So how does the, the Colombian case look? And then, I'm sorry, there's all these questions. One thing that I love about Colombia is that there have been many women in power compared to other Latin American countries. It's one country where you see earlier on, like at the end of the 20th century, women occupying uh, positions of power. Does this have to do with like, you know, seeing women um, activists like like uh, Francia Marquez? I mean, this is something that really sparks my, my curiosity. I know there, there, there are women activists in, among indigenous, but, but in the case of Colombia, you know, there have been women head of, the, of important cabinets for a long time. So do, do you think that there's something about women in Colombia that are more um, at in the as they feel more comfortable in positions of power and does this permeate into the indigenous and and, and afro-colombian activists and i'll stop there and, and thank you so much for a wonderful presentation thank you so much professor those are all so wonderful and i'll do my best to um to address all of them so when it comes to the indigenous population is incredibly diverse there's like hundreds of different ethnic groups in the constitution it does mention indigenous people are defined as indigenous um, but again, with the recognition that it is multi-ethnic and multilinguistic, and so there are also uh, hundreds of different uh, indigenous um, tongues in Colombia. When it comes to organization, so the, the Ethnic Commission, for example, is a confluence of various prominent Black and Indigenous organizations, including the ONIC, which is the National Indigenous Organization of Colombia. And the Colombian case is very fascinating because the indigenous movement managed to institutionalize itself relatively early. So since the early 1980s and it, as a byproduct of intense mobilization in the 1970s. That said, there are of course tensions like in any social movement uh, between the various groups. But I think what is very um, important about the, that the ways in which the ONIC has still managed to channel these very different experiences and demands uh, from indigenous populations. And it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to affect that much their ability to kind of engage as representatives at the national and international level. And I think precisely because of this international uh, in early institutionalization, and this is something I look in my research, is that they're able to have a far more centralized relationship with the Colombian state. So in my experience, I did some I try to work as much as I can with the Ethnic Commission when I'm in Colombia or from the outside. And I was, it's just remarkable how the state seems to know what to do with indigenous populations in some way. It's not that they're good or that it's positive, but they have a kind of a longer historic, historical way of engaging with them. 
it doesn't really know how to engage with Afro descendants in the same way. So I think when it comes to development, when the, when the Colombian government passes a major uh, developmental program or the national budget, it has to consult in theory, black and indigenous populations. And it has been at times, in, I say in theory because it has been Colombia's fantastic at going around all these wonderful laws and legislation. Um, but it means often that indigenous people tend to get an early seat in those conversations. So I think that that is very, uh, very interesting and kind of part of the particularity of black and indigenous movements in Colombia. In the case of Afro, of the Afro-Colombian population, a lot of the movements who, part who participate were in fact in the ethnic commission were kind of movements that were in some ways forced to be created because of the peace, because of the extremity of the conflict in the 1990s. So these are movements that originally emerged as peasant organizations, but increasingly realized that the demands they were making have very particular ethnic connotations, in particular their demands for collective land titles, which set them apart from the other masses of uh, poor and, uh, and landless peasants in Colombia, who since the constitution in some way have struggled to sort of articulate demands um, on the state. So if there's a bit of this tension in which the multicultural state, not that it works necessarily well for black and indigenous people, but it means that peasants struggle to organize around class. So I think there's this tension that, um, that sort of needs to be parsed out a, a little bit more. And that said, though, there are all, all, often these incredible alliances between the peasant movement, as well as Black and Indigenous activists, who do often see themselves as, uh, as either peasants or as rural folk in some way or another. So there are, despite these tensions, there are like really remarkable spaces for solidarity and collaboration. When it comes to the Afro-Colombian population in the constitution, it is actually distinguished. So it says Afro-Colombianos, so Afro-Colombian palenqueros, which refers to the Cimarrones or to the people who um, managed to configure Maroon communities for many, many generations in near Cartagena in the coast, in the Caribbean coast of Colombia. And Raizales, and Ra Raizales refers to the Afro-descendant population of San Andres y Providencia, which is one of the islands in Colombia, which acquired in the 19th century. And he speaks both English and Spanish, but also his own uh, form of Creole. And there's all these tensions with the state around language. But in theory, Colombia is a multilingual country and it has to provide education in all those languages. And the indigenous movement since the 1980s has been very much demanding that education and multilingual uh, teachers are training their communities and teaching their communities. And in some areas they have been quite successful uh, at doing this. Where there has been less success is when it comes part of the constitution mandate of the 1990s and in particular the laws that came in relation to the Afro-Colombian population had to do with the creation of um, a national curriculum around Afro-descendants that has not been implemented. So there is some tensions that um, that part, and in contrast with Brazil, where there was quite a bit of success with um, both um, increasing opportunities for students of African and indigenous descent in universities, Colombia has been way slower. But again, this also speaks to the fact that the Colombian public system has been under attack for many for many decades. So it's a combination of both not responding to sort of these constitutional um, demands and just the fact that uh, public universities have been continuously defunded uh, for decades. Um, I think when it comes to the question of women is interested and I think I'm, this one might speak more from my own experience and perhaps anecdotal experience is that conservative women or women who are part of the establishment have an easier chance getting to a certain level of political representation than women in progressive circles. So I think there is a bit, that said within the movements, black women are central consistently through movements. And even within the ethnic commission, there's like a gender and a woman's chapter that is constantly sort of pushing um, for the, for the experiences of black and indigenous women to become more central and to become central, um, central aspects of policy making by the Colombian state. And, and so I think uh, 
someone like uh, like Francia Marquez reflects that those very progressive and uh, wonderful dynamics within the colonial movement. But it is harder once you start getting to sort of in electoral politics. We always joke within my progressive bubble that is that to be up to get into politics as a woman, you kind of have to start moving to the right. That there, it, it is harder to. And I guess there is like the case of Colombia, I guess it's because there was a lot of women who started kind of getting positions either like in, the, in kind of bilateral organizations. So in that way, perhaps there is more representation. Um, so just to give you a like, concrete example, uh, the Ministry of Col the two black women have been appointed as ministers of culture. And while this was very significant because it was the first time that a black woman was appointed to a ministry, there's also always kind of this tension is like, why are you only appointing them to, um, to the Ministry of Culture? Why not the Ministry of Labor? Why not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? So there is kind of these tensions of which spaces they do get to, um, to occupy. So that, um, I hope that answers most of the questions. Thank you so much, they were so rich. Okay, thank you. Uh, we already have another question from Dr. McDaniel. Thank you for this presentation, Laura. I, I learned so much. Um, my question is about the title of your talk and about the, the concept of peace um, and basically about how movements or activists frame their demands. Um, I was struck that in the, the um, statement that you shared from the coalition, it talked about human and collective rights. And I feel like I'm uh, cutting in, in, in front of my colleague, Laura Woldenthal, who's in, in the audience by asking about um, how they envision human rights in, in, collection, in connection with collective rights, but also about um, the way you said that the, the activists talk about these um, um, you know, progressive claims under the rubric of peace. Um, that, that's kind of striking to me, and I'm wondering how um, different that is from other um, uh, American contexts, broadly speaking, uh, in this time period. Um, is that because of the, the context of, of the long armed conflict uh, in Colombia, did that help uh, in coming to the United States and kind of seeking alliances with, with Congress uh, or, or other actors to sort of frame it in the context of peace? Is it, is it strategic, I guess, or, or does that speak to a, a kind of deeper substantive um, ideological, uh, you know, redefining and reframing of, of peace? So I guess it's a question about frames and where those particular frames of human rights and peace come from, because they, they strike me as in, in some ways distinctive. Yes, thank you, that's, that's fantastic. So for some context, the, the kind of official narrative of the trajectory of ethnic movements in Latin America, which are often traced to the 80s and 1990s, as a historian, I tend to push a little bit against that, that, that kind of trajectory, but what is, what does seem to be the case, even from my own research, is the way in which human rights discourses starting in the 1980s and in the 90s kind of created these openings for Black and Indigenous people to make claims that were previously very difficult to articulate in relation to the state, in part because the Colombian state, as many other Latin American states, saw itself as fundamentally raceless, that race and ethnicity have, Colombia had resolved those kind of issues before and therefore everything was kind of framed around questions of class and political participation in a deracialized way. So I think there is that aspect, but I think there is the other side of, and I think this is definitely very particular to the Colombian experience, is that in some ways the intensity of the war forces these activists to sort of postpone their agendas. And this is something that like a prominent Afro-Colombian leader said in a, in a conference during, in a, in a meeting during the Atlantic Commission is like, the war keeps postponing all the important things we need to do. So including properly getting access to land, pushing for uh, educational curriculum. So there is a way in which the war, and this is something that the activists often say, allows the state to kind of not fulfill its, its commitments to its populations and allows the state not to actually deal with the structural uh, pro with the structural causes of Colombian um, of, of the Colombian conflict, 
I think the other, I think, interesting question of peace is that it did become more prominent, I think, during the peace negotiations. And one of the ways in like a very strategic but powerful way in which these, these Black and Indigenous people positioned themselves was like, we are interlocutors of peace. We have been caught in the middle of all these various armed actors, and we are in a moral and historical position to sort of articulate what peace and what justice means in the, in the country. And they do, and there's a way in which the international community has been better, um, has done a better job than even the Colombian state in sort of like uh, recognizing the specificity. So like there is a lot of N international NGOs, even the United Nations, and now including some of like the more traditional um, bilateral organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank, who do kind of push the state on these questions, but there is this tension again of how much you can actually convince Colombian uh, authorities to do it. And I think the question of peace in some ways is my own, um, I guess, academic category in the sense that I think it is a useful lens to, um, to sort of trace the way in which black and indigenous people are sort of claiming themselves as political actors in the country. And, to highlight the centrality that demands for racial justice and ethnic particularity play in those demands that are simply usually not the subject of policy conversations. So I think if you, for example, went to many of the famous or like the, in the most important spaces that were happening when, San, when President Santos or any of the major representatives of the negotiations came, they were not foregrounding those questions, right? So there is this, the, and, and, and the important for after Santos ended his presidential term, he went to Harvard to do a year. And these are not the questions that he's being asked to address while he's there. And so like there is this tension of um, what the policy establishment in North America, which has so much power actually cares about. And I think there's, there's a difference there's, a, there's been a bit of a trouble in the demands of these actors actually getting to a policy establishment. I think it matters even that the needs are so 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 big and, and so urgent. Okay, um, we're open to more questions. I'm gonna jump in and ask a question <laughs> because I fear I won't get an opportunity. Um, so the I have a question that sort of goes back to Dr. Lopez Alonso's question. Um, a, a little bit or is related to it. I, I would like you to talk a little bit more about where the um, people are in terms of land. I was very struck by that map. And so I'm curious about how is it that those are the regions that become the um, territories for indigenous groups and the territories for black communities. And then if you could also explain if there's any difference between the um, the the legal title to the land or the legal co connection, right? So it, are they are, are both of those territories similar and are they managed in, in a similar way or, or does it have some other kind of meaning, um, you know, when you call that, you know, territory of a, of a black community and, right? Yeah, this, this map, I'm very struck by this map. So yeah, if you could talk a little bit about how is it that those are the places for these populations to be concentrated and then what it means legally to be in those places, like how the land functions, how people are attached to the land. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. So this is the Pacific, when I refer to the Pacific Coast, this little part here in the blue, that's what the um, Afro-Columbian collective land titles are. And the reason the Afro colonial population is so um, demographically significant there is in the area of Cauca and the Chocó during slavery and during colonialism, these were uh, dependent incredibly on Afro descendant labor. But uh, especially this area here in Northern Cauca, which are currently now the sites of like a lot of sugarcane production. So, you know, a lot of the articulations of, of, of colonial dynamics. But then during the, even before uh, slavery was abolished in 1851 and ap after many formerly enslaved people started moving towards the, throughout the Pacific coast because they had, they were, there's a lot of wonderful new research on the ways they were able to sort of create 
peasant autonomies in this region because they're very, it's a very wet, a very jungle and dense territory. So these are not areas where you can farm or produce sugarcane, for example. It's very much attached to sort of the weather and, and, and the climate of the region. But what it does allow, it is very rich in mining. And so this is part of the contemporary complex, but this is the historical reason why the uh, Afro-Colombian population is so present here. And these areas and have been kind of on the periphery of Colombia. So Colombia is in, in, the, Colum in the Latin American historiography is seen as a state who has never been able to sort of, the center has never been able to sort of take control of the periphery and that's one of the reasons it's supposed to be very different from, from other Latin American countries. I mean, the state, it is present, just militarily, that tends to be often how it is present, but not in terms of like infrastructure, education, and the important, um, in the important ways. So this is one of the reasons why uh, the indigenous population here has been sort of allowed to be there without, but they were, I mean, I don't want to get into the details, but there's like also a lot of histories of like, removal and land dispossession both in, ma in like massive massacres well into the 1970s. Uh, in terms of the legal claims they're actually very different. So resguardo which is the category that is applied to indigenous uh, population is a colonial category and it was referred to the land that the crown had allowed the indigenous population to sort of occupy and so some of the resguardos are uh, actually, they were able to trace it. They had the colonial titles and they were able to trace it, but then subsequently through uh, indigenous mobilization throughout the 20th century and through uh, and then in the 21st century, they were able to expand and reconstitute many former areas. When it comes to uh, the territories of black communities, those occupy a very different uh, legal category. So historically, um, in the, 19th, in the 20th century and in the 1960s during um, sort of a forestry and extractivist boom in the region, these areas have been historically populated both by black and indigenous populations. But what the Colombian state did was to refer to it as Tierras Valdias, which is, um, I guess, unoccupied lands for lack of um, the proper translation doesn't occur to me right now. And so for, even though these populations were had very well documented um, collective forms of organizing both labor and property and family relations, the Colombian state essentially kind of flattened those dynamics, which allow a lot of white and mestizo col colonos, which translates loosely into colonizers, to sort of get to those territories. So when we get to the 1990s and the war starts getting really out of hand, um, there, this is the reason why a lot of black and indigenous people start being either kicked out of the land or experiencing, they be, these become really central areas for territorial dispute between various armed actors. So what the 1991 constitution does through law 70, which is the law of black communities, is to sort of reconstitute those spaces as having, as uh, Afro descendants having collective claim to the land. But they, they have very different histories and the way that they, the state deals with them is also very different. And that's a great question. I think I need to think through this more actually for the book. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Um, we have, let's see, a couple of questions in the uh, question in the chat. Um, ben asks, uh, I'm wondering to what extent black territory on the Pacific coast is segregated from integrated into the Colombian state? Um, that's a great question. So there, here's where we get into um, questions of political autonomy and self-determination that are very much at the core of the demands that Black and Indigenous activists are making both around the 1991 constitution, but increasingly given the dynamics of uh, increasing extractivism and incursion in their territories by armed actors. So I think what I think what these, move, these movements and forms of collective organization are trying to carve out a some kind of regional autonomy with the state. I think this is perhaps a, a way to, to think about it. And it's not that they're not trying to be part of Colombia. That is not 
the, the objective at all, but it is trying to sort of renegotiate with the state what the relationship is. And in part is like allowing them to implement, for example, the right to previous consultation, which is like if the government is supposed to create, give a contract to X corporation, the collective uh, communities there get to decide if that's going to be implemented. So I think it's a renegotiation between uh, the central state and um, black and indigenous communities. And I have to say, it's not always very successful. Like at least 48% of, um, of Afro-descendant collective lands are constantly being used for illegal mining. And again, this is incredibly, this happens through incredibly violent and process of, of dispossession and removal. And this helps explain all the recent massacres as well. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, I think we could have one last question before we let everybody go, because I know people have in-person class at one o'clock. Um, I can't see everyone because you're sharing your screen, so I can't, I can <laughs> sorry. Oh, uh, Dr. Satino has raised his hand. Go ahead, Dr. Satino. Thank you for that uh, very interesting and informative talk, and especially the, the answers to, I've, I've to the questions I've learned a lot. Um, one of the, the things that I uh, was very interested in that you talked about are the different political tactics used by uh, black and indigenous activists, um, including strikes and demonstrations. And um, um, among uh, those tactics was, um, I think you mentioned um, a kind of transnational activism in North America, in the United States and establishing ties with the Congressional Black Caucus, with figures on the American left like Angela Davis, um, with members of the Obama administration. Um, and my question is very simple. Has, has that tactic been um, successful? Um, has, it, has it produced results? Have activists been able to leverage the role of the United States, especially the, you know, the economic importance, the economic importance to Columbia of American aid um, in uh, bringing their own voices out, uh, achieving tangible um, political objectives? Thank you, that's, that's a fantastic question. And actually they have been successful in very uh, interesting ways. So for example, one of the leaders of HEM, uh, his name is, um, oh my God, how am I forgetting his name right now? Um, He's been a prominent figure and he's one of the most important uh, Afro, Afro the Afro-Colombian victims of the war organization, Marino Cordova. Um, and Marino's Cordova, I think is instructive in understanding kind of these transnational histories, which I would love to write or for someone to write about it because it's just fascinating. Um, and Marino uh, was forced to leave Colombia because he was going, he was a, a, a communal leader and he was gonna get killed by the paramilitaries. So he ended up moving to the US. He ended up organizing for Obama's campaign. So again, we got these kind of transnational networks and he was part of a labor union in the US and he was involved in, in, in those political struggles there. In the early 2000s, Colombia was negotiating with president, right-wing president Alvaro Uribe Vélez, a free trade agreement with the US. And what black, and black organizations and indigenous organizations managed to do was to force certain restrictions on what the free trade agreement could do in, in, in Colombia. So it, it, in some ways, I think this speaks to like longer histories of transnationalism in which the international arena allows for certain conversations around race and racial justice that the domestic arena just doesn't always facilitate in Colombia. And they were actually able to to, to the rage of, the, of Uribe to forestall some of the things he wanted to do in their territory. So I think that's a useful example. That said, US military funding to Colombia is incredibly high and is used in many, many problematic ways against the civilian population and against activists. And I think that will be harder to, to, to change However, there was a reason in the recent national strike, one of the demands of the, both black and indigenous organizations, but just in general civil society in the country was appealing so that the US stop uh, providing military and equipment that was being used by the police to repress um, political organization in the country. 
So again, it has been successful in some interesting ways, but then you do have these longer and complicated histories of empire between Colombia and the US that in some ways make it very structurally difficult to, um, to fundamentally alter. Um, but they have found great allies like Noam Chomsky, Angela Davis are constant, uh, very well informed and very involved in, in the struggles of these communities and not just recently for like many, um, many decades now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. I learned a lot. I took notes. I'm going to have to harass you in the hallway even more to ask questions. I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate to be just down the hall from uh, uh, Laura. So uh, this for me is really lucky. But um, thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you giving us an hour of your time to learn and to have this conversation. Again, please feel free to join us on October the 5th for Eric Huntington and November the 18th for Jamin Kim. And again, applause for Dr. Correa. Thank you All so right. much. I'm glad I got to tell you about contemporary stuff in Colombia. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye.